Jim Ed and got it in Poplar Creek. I guess Stevie goes to. Are you going to Poplar Creek? All right. And your girlfriend is Karen. Glad to have them. Good to see Frank Crumb back there. He's still, he's still leading hope with us. And, uh, so we're going to have hope, by the way, this May. And we're going to have hope in June. And we're going to have hope in July. Praise the Lord. we got enough money to do that. And uh, so we're getting ready. So don't forget, uh, Saturday, men, we'll have to uh, go uh, unload that stuff for, for hope. All right. But we're looking, we're glad we can do that. Good to see the three musketeers here. Sammy, Stevie, and Bebo. They're the revival men. This ain't yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, how many revivals, y'all? Is this make 15? This is the 15th revival they've been to this year. And you know, I was so tickled to see them when I was over at Brushy at the Heenan Church of Christ. I rode with them, matter of fact, so I, I, they, they had to go with me. No, I, I went with them, but... I'm glad they went over there. And that was a trip, wasn't it, boys? <laughs> glad to have them. Good to see Lisa's daddy. <laughs> uh, glad he can be with us. Good to be with the him. And uh, you know what? He, oh. Mose. Mose. Yeah, Mose Ramsey. What is wrong with my brain, Mose? Brooke said it's your brain, Billy. It's your brain. Ruthie Moore, good to see you, and uh, Barb, good to see her. Anybody else visiting? We're glad to have you. Uh, Gary, yeah, wow, yeah, good to see Gary back there. <laughs> that's Brooks' older. That's Butch's older brother. You know what he told me? He said you can believe about half of what Butch tells you. So, so but I believe about everything Butch tells me. But anyway, I, I just. Repeating his brother, okay? <laughs> Just kidding you, buddy. All right, Russ Dillwins. He's here, him and his wife, Kim. So don't forget that. You can't miss her. She's a redhead. And it's real red to her, too. It's not fake, not from a bottle. <laughs> uh, okay. Rusty, uh, you know, Rusty's been preaching longer than I thought he had. He's been preaching for about 19 years, started when he was 14. And he was raised up at the uh, Garden Creek uh, Church Christ, and uh, he started preaching early. And guess what? His great-grandfather is Johnny Hagerman. So many of y'all might remember Johnny Hagerman. Uh, so uh, that was his great-grandfather. Oh, your great-uncle. It said, my great-grandfather's house, which was John Hagerman. Oh, that was, okay. Okay. Yeah, church started in their home. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, Brother Rusty, huh? What's well, all right, buddy. He went to Bluefield College of Evangelism in 1999 and for about three years and then also took some more classes at Bluefield College of Evangelism. And uh, he's been in the ministry since uh, uh, for about 19 years. So, And his wife is Kim and they have three kids. His oldest son is 20, whom he raised since he is 12, since a boy was 12. They have an 18 year old, senior named Hannah and a 14 year old named Tyler and he was to be 15 tomorrow and is in the ninth grade so anyway uh, that's what I don't know about Rusty but what I do know is that he preaches at the Blackie Church of Christ over in Virginia so well over around at Hurley so we're glad to have old Rusty Owens with us he's been on the radio all week so he should be tuned up shouldn't he yeah. he should be ready to preach and uh uh, so if you want to hear Rusty again in the morning, 100.7 FM, and I can usually get it on my radio, so 9.30 every morning. So Rusty, come on, brother. Preach the gospel. Yeah. 
I sure do uh, appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, and as I think Chris said, I have preached here uh, before. And, and I'll just clarify that, uh, of course, when I grew up in the Garden Creek Church of Christ, um, Stanley Smith, that preaches over at Big Branch, he was the preacher there for a while. And, and he started letting the young boys, the young men, I guess once every, uh, one Sunday evening, every month, uh, sort of letting some of the young men there preach. And so I was 14 at the time. But as far as going, being ordained into the ministry uh, as an evangelist, uh, I was uh, 18 years old at that time, and that was in 2000. And um, that has been my heart's desire ever since I was 14 years old to be a preacher of the gospel. And, and standing here 19 years later, nothing at all has changed. Uh, I love my Lord. I love His church. Amen. I love the people of God, and and of course I, I love people, and and just hope that along this journey that God He'll continue to. We know that He'll bless His word Amen. as it's preached, but I uh, just hope that um, He'll continue to be able to use me as a instrument or as a mouthpiece as His servant to tell people about the glorious news of the gospel. Um, it's just such a wonderful blessing to be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the greatest friend we'll ever have. Amen. I'm going to talk this evening about just that and preach this evening about that. Who is Jesus? And of course, I'm going to talk and, and preach about the church. But before you preach about the church, you as far as I'm concerned, you need to know who the church belongs to. Amen. So that's Jesus. Uh, before we get started, let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful blessings that you've provided us with. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of the safety of travel that we've had as we've come here and we've met together as the church of our, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and Father, as we come together this evening and we've had fellowship and just beautiful fellowship with one another and we've sung praises unto, the, uh, unto your holy name. And Father, as we come together it's time to preach from the word of God, Father, I pray that Ears will be open, hearts will be pricked by the preaching of the gospel. And Father, I just pray that you'll help me to preach your word in a way that is pleasing unto you. Father, I know there's absolutely nothing that I can do or say on my own accord. But Father, I just want to be your messenger this evening. I want to deliver your word. Father, I feel humble to stand before people and to preach your word, but to but also I feel the responsibility of the word of God. This is the greatest news in all of the world, the greatest message in all of the world. Amen. And you've enabled men, uh, even men such as that we've got here with us this evening, uh, uh, Brother Jim Belcher and, and Frank Crum and Billy and myself as preachers of the gospel, you've enabled us, Father. And, and there may be others, but... That to be able to stand up and to preach the word of God, it's, it's the greatest honor in all of the world. Father, help us never to take it lightly. Help us, Father, to feel the burden to declare your word and declare it in all of its truth. Amen. Father, I pray that you will forgive me in the ways that I've sinned against you, any way that I've fallen short. And Father, I thank you for your precious, wonderful gift of your son, Jesus. He's the mediator between man and God, or between man and God, and the only hope that we have of eternal life is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here this evening that's not a Christian, I pray, Father, that we'll see they'll make that decision this evening, that they'll respond to the gospel message, that they'll receive it gladly, and that they'll repent of their sins and be baptized in water this evening for the forgiveness of their sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And they'll raise to walk in a newness of life. Amen. Father, I ask once again, you forgive me in the ways I've fallen short. It's in Jesus' sweet and precious name that I pray. 
Amen. Amen. I do want to say before I get started, of course, I've come, I've come over here. Uh, I remember even before the time that I, I preached here, of course, I remember growing up at the Garden Creek Church of Christ and Uncle Johnny, of course, was a member here. And I remember coming over here, me and my brother, uh, um, ever since we were little and, uh, and very fond memories. I'll always remember, and I guess I'll never come to church here or come in in this building. I'll never come in here that I don't remember Uncle Johnny and Kenneth and Helena singing and just wonderful, beautiful memories. Um, but to, to begin the message this evening, I want, us, want you to turn with me over to John chapter 15 and verse 13. John, four, I'm sorry, John chapter 15, verse 13 and 14. I want to read a scripture there. John chapter 15, beginning with verse 13. And this tells us about the love of Jesus. You know how I could never fathom in my little mind, how Jesus could love me enough to die for me. This scripture right here, it tells us in verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And isn't that just a beautiful, heartwarming thought that Jesus, 100% man, and 100% God all at the same time would love me and love you enough that he would lay down his life so that we could become his friends. Amen. You know, love, it means to think and do the best for someone else. And when I think of what Jesus thought of me and what he did for me, I realize that there's never been anyone that's loved me any more than Jesus. And if I live to be a hundred years old on this earth or even older, there'll still never be anyone that will love me as much as Jesus Christ. I'm eternal, eternally grateful for my Lord. Amen. In verse 14, it tells us, and this is what he wants. He wants us to be his friends. And he tells us in verse 14 how that happens. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, who is Jesus? Not only is it imperative to realize who Jesus is, to realize the value of him, how valuable Jesus is, but you must be his friend. You must belong to him. You must love him. You must serve him. And you must be faithful to him even to the very end. Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life, according to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Now, I didn't write this little poem or this poem that I'm going to read to you, but I like what it says. The title of it is, Jesus is. God is Lord Almighty, omnipotent King, the Lion of Judah, the Rock of Ages, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the provider, the protector, the paternal leader, ruling Lord and reigning king of all the universe. He is God, the son, helper, guardian, and the word. He is the first and last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all he keeps. The architect of the universe and the manager of all times. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. He is unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and, and he eases pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He was risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. And the leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. The people couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The New Age can't replace him. 
and Ted Turner can't explain him away. He's the greatest person that has ever lived. The Gospel of John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, speaking about Jesus, it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He is eternal. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's, as we said, he's the creator of this universe. He created you and I. And one day he'll be judge and we'll stand before him and give an account of our lives to him. But you know, this is something that man put together. It's not inspired or but there's a lot of truth in what I just, there's truth in what I just read about Jesus. But let's go to what the word of God says about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13 through 19. And let's learn who he is from Peter. Matthew chapter 16, if you want to turn with me, you can. But in verse 13, the Bible says this, When Jesus came into the coasts, into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, and two questions is going to be asked here about Jesus. But he asked the first question. He asks his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And I want you to notice here, you and I sitting here this evening, while we've got our minds made up who Jesus is, but a lot of people out in the world, they have a completely different view of who Jesus is. If you want to know who Jesus is, you don't go and ask somebody that's lost. You don't go and ask somebody that's been confused by the world. You go straight to the source, which is the word of God. And But Jesus asked the question here, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And in verse 14, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now he's going to get more personal. He's going to say, now this is what men say about me, but I want to know, who do you say that I am? And that's a good question for us to consider this evening. Amen. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but he asked that question, and Peter, Peter was bold. He didn't shrink back from a challenge. He didn't shrink back when it came time for him to confess his Lord before men. And so Peter spoke up and he said, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, which means son of John, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Singular because there's only one and it belongs to Christ. Amen. I will build my church Amen. and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose, or I'm sorry, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now let's go back and look at these verses and learn exactly who Jesus is. First of all, and we'll compare what men said about Jesus um, from this scripture in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Once again, it said when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I am? And they responded, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now think for just a moment. You know, that was a compliment, or at least it seems. You remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist? What went you out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? And he began to tell them about, uh, about John the Baptist. And remember what he said about John? There's never been a man born of woman any greater than John the Baptist. But I want to say something to you. He didn't stop there. You know, whenever it came to John the Baptist, John the Baptist was a great man. He had a great work to do. Why, well, he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. We learned that through Scripture. 
Even going back to the book of Malachi, in the last chapter of Malachi, it describes the work of John the Baptist, and he was the forerunner. And what a forerunner would do, he would go ahead of a king that was coming into town, and he would announce the coming of the king and, and, and prepare the way for the king, and he would smooth out any potholes in the road and get things ready. The king is coming. And wasn't that what John did? Why, he did that. He had a good work. John, he... He even preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. The kingdom is coming. Repent. He was the forerunner. He was preparing things for Jesus. Right. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 1, you can read about the way that John's disciples was following him and Jesus was there. And, and he, he told them, said, he pointed them to Jesus and he said, I must decrease and he must increase. John even said that the very shoes of Jesus, I'm not worthy to, to reach down and, and latch. My John was a great man. My point is, John was a great man, but he doesn't compare it to Jesus. Amen. In John 1 verse 29, John said himself, Behold, and the word behold means to put your eyes upon something and fix your eyes upon it and gaze on it intently. Well, he realized who Jesus was. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Savior. I prepared the way for the one that was coming that can save you. And in John chapter 1 and verse 29, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It's Jesus, not me. Amen. The disciples said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, a good man even a good preacher, and even someone that would stand up for righteousness. You remember what he said to Herod? Why, he lost his head, but he told Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Right. And he stood up for what was right. So John was a good man, but he wasn't Jesus. There's never been, been another man. There's never been anyone like Jesus. Amen. Some say that they are John the Baptist. And you look around today in the world, they may have good thoughts about Jesus. But that's not enough. Jesus don't want us just to think you're a good man. He wants us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. He wants us to recognize without you, I'm going to hell. But let's move on to the next person. Whom do men say that I am? Not only John the Baptist, but Elias or Elijah. Elijah was a great man, a great prophet. One of the things that we note about Elijah was that there was two men in the Bible that never died. Elijah. And I'll give you a chance here. Somebody can tell me the other one. Enoch. And I love that thought about Enoch and and this isn't in the scripture, but I want to tell you my thought about Enoch. Enoch was a man, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. The Bible says Enoch, he walked with God. And he was not for God to. Amen. And here's the way that I envision this in my mind. Enoch had served God to such a degree and he loved God. And they had walked together in in complete unity and they had walked together for years and for years and as they walked together maybe hand in hand and he'd been walking with God for such a long time that one day they were walking together and this is what I have in mind that God looked at Enoch and he said Enoch you know you've been walking with me for years now You've been walking with me for a long time. I know you've got to be tired. And by this time, you're closer to my house than you are yours. Why don't you come on home with me tonight? Isn't that a beautiful thought? It's going to happen to all of us one day. If we walk with God for years and we're devoted to him one day, we're going to leave from this world and we're going to be with God for all of eternity. But Elijah, he was that prophet of God. He didn't see death. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that a, a chariot of fire came down and a whirlwind and took him up to heaven. My, wouldn't you like to have seen that? I would have. So when these people, they thought about Jesus, they had good thoughts about Jesus. Elijah. Maybe when people thought about Jesus, the disciples said, you know, some people think you're Jeremiah. And what Jeremiah is known for is the weeping prophet. It's a good reason that Jesus would have fit that description. During the life of Jesus, he never saw anyone that was in need that he didn't help. That's right. He had a compassionate heart. And even right now he does. The scripture tells us in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 that we can cast all of our cares upon him for he cares for us. Yeah. I'm reminded in Matthew chapter 23 whenever Jerusalem was there and they were scattered about as, as chicks that were lost or that had went away from their hen. And Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if thou would, why well, would gather you as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, but you would not. You'll not come. And why, when I envision that, I can just see Jesus' heart broken for his love of the people and he wanted to care for them. He wanted to protect them. He wanted to just take them under his wings as a, as a mother hen would care for her babies. Right. So they saw that compassion about Jesus. And they said, well, Jesus, he's one, he's Jeremiah. And then other people, they thought, well, he's just one of the prophets. Jesus was, was a prophet, the greatest prophet that ever lived. He was prophet, priest, and king. But I like the next part of this scripture in verse 15. Peter nailed it right on the head. If you see, Jesus asked another question. And, and I tell you this evening, Jesus, he's not so much concerned about what your neighbor thinks about him as, as he is what you care or what you think about him this evening. So I said, he wants you to belong to him. He wants you to love him. He wants a relationship with you. Amen. And I don't know about you, but when I think about that, that the one that could create this world out of nothing, that out of everything in this world, he wants a relationship with me. Why, well, it does something to me. But in verse 15, listen to what Peter says. And we read it, but... Listen to it again. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Now this was his disciples. And I want to tell you what a disciple is. Well, some people may think, well, a disciple is an apostle. No. You see, every apostle had to be a disciple, but not every disciple is not an apostle. And I want to explain the difference. You sitting here this evening, if you're a Christian, you need to be a disciple, or you must be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yes. A disciple would be someone that would sit at the feet of a master teacher and learn. A disciple, there's three things that make up a disciple. They are a learner, and then when they learn the things that their teacher teaches them, they imitate that. And they follow their master wherever their master leads them. That's a disciple. As I said, every apostle had to be a disciple. They had to be a follower of Jesus. They had to learn of Jesus. They had to imitate the things of Jesus. But an apostle, the difference is an apostle had to be hand chosen or hand picked by Jesus Christ. But Peter said, when he was asked this question, Peter said in verse 16, he answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I heard one time that history recorded that, that this was so boldness from Peter because Caesar had made the decree that if anyone would confess any other person but him, he could be killed right on the spot. So Peter, when he said this, he was bold. He didn't have any fear of death. He was going to stand up for Jesus and declare exactly who he was, no matter if it cost him his life. 
Well, shouldn't that be our desire this evening that we're so strong in our faith that even if it costs us our life, we're going to serve Jesus. Amen. We're going to tell the world about Jesus. Even, even, by, even the fear of death will still proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So who did Peter say he was? He's unlike any other man. Peter said, thou art the Christ. The word Christ means anointed one. He was anointed. He was set aside by God his Father, by God the Father from the very foundation of the world to come here and to die for you and I. No one else could do it. He was perfect. He was the anointed one. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, of course, you make that mouth confession before men, before you're baptized and you know, this evening in a crowd such as this, if there's someone that's never confessed the great and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, I hope before this evening is over that you will do that. Right. Don't be ashamed of it. Amen. Don't deny the name of Jesus. Don't shrink back just because of the crowd. Why, I'll stand here, we'll confess it together, and I'm sure every saint or child of God in here would confess that name gladly this evening. That he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's the greatest statement that there is. And we're going to see how powerful that is. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, the scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other. Salvation in any other name given among men under heaven. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Acts 4 verse 12. Christ, he's valuable. Peter, in verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, son of John. You didn't learn this from other men. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but this has been given unto you from my Father, which is in heaven. You're blessed, Peter. Peter was given that knowledge from the Father. Now I want to tell you, some people they'll doubt who Jesus was, but even the Father declared two times who Jesus was. In Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus traveled to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, and he was baptized on that day, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove, and there was a voice that came from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, another time that Jesus was there with Peter, James, and John, and on that mount, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was there, and there appeared with him Moses and Elijah, and on that day, Peter, or, or, or Peter was able to see Jesus as he was transfigured before them. And was able to see Jesus in all of his glory. And to see Moses and Elijah there. And they'd been dead for hundreds of years. And they were talking. And he saw Jesus. The glory of him revealed. Peter spoke like a lot of people would. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. One for you. One for Moses. And one for Elijah. And by doing that, maybe Peter didn't mean it this way. I have no idea, but he was making Jesus equal with John, with the, or, or I'm sorry, Moses and Elijah, and he was putting them on the same plane. There was a voice that came from heaven once again. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Listen to him. Amen. Christ is valuable. You know, he's the greatest man that has ever lived. And if he's the greatest man that ever lived, when it comes to the church, why, well, he has the greatest institution. That's right. Jesus is the builder of the church. In verse 18, he said, Upon this rock, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Upon this rock, what rock is he talking about? Well, a lot of the religious world would think, well, the rock that Jesus was talking about was Peter. Remember, Jesus gave Peter that name. He said, I want to call you Peter. 
Petra, because you're a rock. You'll stand for me. But the rock that Peter was was a small, movable stone that you could pick up and move. And you see that with his character at times. Lord, I'll never be offended at you. I'll die with you. And then before the cock crow, what did he do? He was moved from his faith and he denied Jesus three times. And, Peter, and Jesus knew not only the physical appearance of Peter, but he knew his character. He knew his heart. He knew his failures. And he does so with you and I as well. But, but that's not, when he, whenever he said that upon this rock I will build my church, he wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about that rock-like statement that Peter had made. That monumental statement that Peter had made. Yeah. That was a boulder. He was talking about, I'm going to build my church upon the very fact that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church rests upon exactly who I am. And, and if you have me as its foundation, you will never fail. Amen. Amen. The church will never perish Amen. as long as Christ is its foundation. Amen. Jesus, how wonderful Jesus is. Jesus, that statement that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, it is a boulder that is fixed permanently. The church is founded, built, and rests upon the very fact that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But there was also a, remember Jesus as a prophet. He gives a prophetic statement. I will build my church. Here in Matthew chapter 16, it hadn't happened yet. Now, when was it built? Not only did he build his church, he purchased the church. That shows how valuable the church is. You know, some people, they say, well, I'll, I'll love Jesus. I'll be committed to Jesus. I'll take Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with the church. That's ridiculous. Yeah. If you realize how valuable Jesus is, he's the head of the church and the church is his body. The body of Christ is just as valuable as what the head is. Amen. And when you realize what was paid for the church, You'll never make a statement like that. If you're committed to Jesus, you'll be committed to the church. Right. If you're committed to him and faithful to him on Sunday or, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, you'll be faithful to him in the Lord's house on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. So here, this church, the prophetic statement is, I will build my church. How much is the church worth? Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says, that he purchased the church with his own blood. When he hung and died on Calvary's cross, he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about you and I. He was thinking about his beautiful bride, the church. He, did, he took his own physical needs and put them on the back burner. and He put her needs before his own, the church. I want to tell you what I'm talking about. He said, I thirst. And he truly thirsted on that evening. Hanging there in the heat of the day and dying. But you know what we get? Well, we get to drink of the living water of life. <coughs> well, he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. The Bible tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And you know what happens because his blood was shed? We have that blood applied to our lives in the waters of baptism and it washes away every sin that we've ever committed. Amen. He put our needs before his own. That's how valuable the church is to him. If you are a member of his church, you are bought with his precious blood. The church also, as Jesus, another attribute or the characteristic of Jesus is he's powerful. Why, he was the most powerful person that ever lived. He's all-knowing. He can be everywhere. Uh, we know that God is ever-present, but he's all-powerful as well. The church is too. Upon this rock I will build my church, and what did he say? That not even the gates of hell shall prevail against it. Amen. The church is powerful. It's singular. There's only one. Paul said in Ephesians 4, verse 4, there's one body. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23 says that he uh, the... the He's been given to be the head over all things of the church, which is, which is his body. That belongs to him. He's the most powerful man that's ever lived. His church is the most powerful institution that there has ever been. Who is Jesus? As I close this message this evening, 
Jesus said of himself, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Thomas saith, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Who is Jesus? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. I'm going to close this message. Matthew 16, verse 19. Jesus, he said, Peter, I'm going to give, give unto you. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. You're blessed. But he told him, said, I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he gave him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Fifty-three days after the death of Jesus, fifty days after his resurrection, Peter stood on a day of Pentecost. In the door of the church it was opened for the very first time. The gospel was preached for the very first time. And Peter, he preached in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, and he said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this Jesus, this same Jesus whom you have crucified, hath been made both Lord and Christ. Who is Jesus? You killed him. He's not dead now. He's Christ. He is Lord. When the people heard that, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Greatest man that ever lived, the greatest lover of our soul. He's got the greatest institution that there has ever been. Amen. And if you'll obey him, you can become his friend. If you'll repent of your sins and make up your mind that you want to follow after Jesus, Make a mouth confession before men that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Lord will add you to his beautiful, glorious church. Amen. And you'll Amen. raise out of that water to walk in a newness of life. Amen. We know who Jesus is. He knows who you are. Mm -hmm. He knows whether you're boss or whether you're serving him as a Christian, to the best of your ability. If you're lost this evening, don't leave this building that way. We're going to sing your invitation hymn this evening, and we hope that you'll come in obedience to the gospel. Amen. And as we sing. And the